So our first speaker today is Rebecca Evenden, who is the Bayes Director for Space. Um, Rebecca joined the um, uh, Bayes from the UK Space Agency, where she was Director for International and has held many senior roles in the civil service, which makes her an extremely valuable person to have in the role. As part of her first um, activity was to develop the first UK national space strategy, and I'm delighted that she's here today to speak about the implementation of that strategy. Rebecca. Thank you so much, Sarah, and it is really nice to be here today. I, I've been in and around the government space policy environment, I think, for about seven years, and it never actually made it to this conference before, so I'm not sure why, but, um, but really, really delighted to be here today. And I think, you know, just listening to you talk about what you do here at RAL, it, it just emphasises how much uh, RAL has grown and developed over the last few years, just reflecting the growing maturity, I think, that we're seeing right across the sector in the UK. But I just wanted to take this opportunity to reflect a little bit on 2022, as we are coming towards the end of it. Uh, and I think, you know, we can be proud that there have been uh, a good number of firsts this year. Uh, so our National Space Strategy, of course, was published last year, so that's not technically a first for this year. Um, but taking it forward and delivering it, has of course been what we've been focusing on um, over the past 11 months or so. <clears throat> and I think first, um, there are a, a, a really significant number. Two weeks ago, we saw the first spaceport license for Spaceport Cornwall being issued. A really significant step forward towards our ambition to be the first European country to launch a satellite into orbit. We can't quite bag that one yet. Launch hasn't quite happened yet. But hopefully, um, very, very shortly, we'll be able to say we've now had our first launch as well. We launched our first ever plan for sustainability. Uh, a real priority and, and a growing area of interest for government is that leadership role that the UK can take in making sure that space remains open and accessible uh, as an environment for everybody. So that was in July last year. And if you haven't looked at that, please have a look because it does set out an ambitious plan for regulatory leadership in the UK, um, for technological development, and for the role of industry in driving forward uh, a set of standards. Uh, only last week, we published uh, a, our first domestic Earth observation support package. Uh, I'll come on to the situation with Copernicus in a minute. But again, I think an important step forward showing how we intend to support our Earth observation industry in the UK. And of course, we've had the first defence space strategy as well this year, which is a, a sort of daughter document, if you like, to the national space strategy. And it's really great to see the Ministry of Defence taking forward their space ambitions in such a strong way as well. And then finally, uh, we can't not mention uh, the ESA Council of Ministers last week. I'm sure Paul will talk about this. I'm just looking at him. We haven't coordinated, so <laughs> he's not shaking his head, uh, and, and Dave maybe as well. But again, uh, two really, really important firsts there. I mean, of course, the biggest package of investment that the UK has ever made into ESA. Yes, but the first female career astronaut for the UK and the first ever para-astronaut in the world. So let's bag all of that and feel proud of it. But, let, but going forward, we've obviously got a lot more to do over the next year. 2020, uh, the 2020s have signalled, I think, the beginning of a new era. And of course, you'll hear from ministers that we want to be right at the front of the sort of surge of the space sector globally as it takes up the new opportunities offered by uh, innovation, through technological development, and through increasing investment into the sector. And our ambition set out in the strategy, of course, is to capitalise on all of this uh, to create one of the most innovative and attractive space economies in the world. So I'm just going to do a brief counter through where I think we've got to in terms of taking forward those four pillars which we set out in the strategy. And the first, of course, is about unlocking growth in the sector. We've seen the fantastic success here in Harwell of the development of the cluster approach, which is now being uh, built on and not replicated, but learned from and developed right across the UK with great progress in the Northeast and the Northwest, 
of course, uh, in Glasgow and of course in Cornwall as well. And we continue to make sure that our regulatory environment is the best it can be. So we've, we ran a call for evidence on or orbital liability limits last year. Uh, and we are, of course, continuing to work closely with the insurance sector to see how we can drive the right kind of behaviours uh, to support uh, sustainable space. That will be, I think, a theme that we continue to focus on throughout 2023. And Minister Freeman, for those of you who've heard him talk about this, is very, very passionate about what government needs to do in order to make the right kind of environment in space. And we're now looking to see where we can go further in developing a space sector plan. And I'll come on to that again shortly. So that's the sort of growth agenda, if you like. And then the second area is international collaboration. We've talked about ESA. And I think what you've seen over the past week is the, the, the long-term commitment from the UK to ESA. I think there was a bit of doubt, you know, over the past couple of years, post-Brexit, people were asking questions, what's, what's the UK's role going to be in ESA going forward? Well, I think we've answered that question loud and clear now. We're a fully committed major player in ESA, and I think that will be um, continued going forward. A great package of things uh, agreed at ESA for the UK, Rosalind Franklin, uh, huge investment into science, uh, great projects like the UK's leadership role in Vigil, and of course the astronauts as well. So that's a strong and enduring partnership, and I just want to leave that message with you all loud and clear. And the third pillar was about growing the UK as a science superpower. Uh, Minister Freeman again talks about this passionately. His two sort of priority areas, if you, you may have heard him speak, several times on this topic, growing the UK as a science power and creating an innovation nation. And science is gonna to continue to be one of the core strengths of the UK, I'm absolutely convinced. And not just because of the contributions that we make to ESA, but we're about to embark on a series of bilateral collaborations as well. Uh, building on those really strong partnerships we have in NASA and JAXA and Australia going forward. And of course, the Space Innovation Programme, which has been successful thus far, um, we expect to see continued and into the coming year. Um, and hopefully there will be a new uh, round of uh, funding announced for the NSIP programme too. <laughs> and the final pillar is about becoming ever more resilient. We can build fantastic capabilities, but if they're not resilient, then that's not so effective. So having resilient capabilities helps defend our national interests. And this is where we have to work closely with, the, uh, with colleagues in the Ministry of Defence through Space Command in order to exploit those opportunities for dual use. We're working ever more closely with the MOD and there are three particular areas that we are focusing on at the moment where we think there, is, there are some early quick wins that we can capitalise on um, around dual use opportunities. Mm -hmm. So through the, through the thinking we're doing on Earth observation, uh, as a result of the investment that we are now making into that sector, using some of the money that would have been committed to Copernicus had we associated over the past couple of years, uh, we will be exploring opportunities with the MOD going forward on Earth observation. And secondly, in skills, we have to get the skills pipeline right. And it doesn't make any sense to make sure that we're doing that just for civil space, Let's do it for the whole space sector and look at um, the needs of the space workforce as a whole. And then finally on space situational awareness, we've already got great work and a, a good collaborative program on the National Space Operations Center, but we can continue to do more and that will be, I think, a subject of the year going forward. And that, before I finish, and I know uh, Sarah <laughs> is, gonna, is going to ask to finish quite soon, I just want to talk about the work we're doing on capability development, capability development and goals, and also the sector plan, because I know this is, a, this is an area that people have been interested in. Uh, I'll be honest, it's been a turbulent year, and in some areas it's been quite hard to make progress on some issues. We've had changes of ministers, there's been uncertainty about the funding environment, but we now do have a science minister who's very clear about what he wants. We have a secretary of state who is equally passionate about space. And we have a chancellor who has committed to protect the R&D budget. 
So that signals, I think, commitment to science and technology and innovation. Uh, the cabinet also had a lengthy discussion on science and technology this week. The first time I can remember that, they, that the cabinet has discussed science and technology at length um, in, in quite some time. So what we are doing now is we're putting together a set of national capability goals to try and set out a coherent picture for what government is going to need going forward and how we might work towards them. It should support the development of a longer term roadmap for UK space operations and opportunities in the UK. And, and from that, to give signal to industry about what it is we're going to need, which should help you with your investment decisions. And alongside this, we are finalising the thinking on our space sector policy. Uh, we've, we've needed to um, wait to engage ministers on this. There are important decisions about government interventions, but we'll accelerate that and hope to publish something early into the new year. So I just want to close by saying, you know, that's quite a lot, I think, in a year. But, you know, we know that there is a massive amount still to do. And I think bringing some clarity around capability needs, around what our expectation is for the development of the sector, around how we, we intend to take forward the Earth observation piece. Policy is still that we want to associate with Copernicus, but we all know that's increasingly difficult. And so we are doing a lot of thinking about how we build on that transitional package that we've announced to develop a longer term Earth observation policy, should we need it. So that's 2023. Um, I think it's going to be uh, another busy one. Um, I think today is a fantastic uh, celebration of everything that's being achieved. Some great speakers lined up and thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Rebecca. You are a chair's dream because you finished well ahead of time, which gives me an opportunity to also welcome our online uh, visitors to, to this conference as well. So we're going to have plenty of time for questions. Um, if you're online, please do submit questions via the Q&A um, uh, chat line, um, and these will be picked up in the lecture theatre and will be asked by Vicky. Um, I will go to the audience first for a couple of questions why people online actually type their questions. So first question for Rebecca. Okay, while you're thinking, I will ask, I will ask my first question. So you mentioned the challenges around skills and how important skills are. We have quite a, a good lineup of skills talks today. What do you think are the key challenges around getting people skilled up and into the space sector? Uh, well, I, th I think from my point of view, the challenge is understanding what it is that government needs to do in terms of providing the right inputs and the right signals, and then how the sector responds. So I think the thing that we've slightly struggled, we've had a sort of dialogue, I think, ongoing for a little while, which goes something like, we know there are skill shortages. Um, we know that we need more people to come through the talent pipeline. And then there's a sort of gap, <laughs> which is, and what is government going to do? And then what is industry going to do? So there's some really good pieces of work, I think, going on at the moment, which are trying to understand the evidence uh, and to map out where those gaps are coming from. Um, I know that the skills advisory panel has been doing some fantastic work here. Uh, it's one of our work streams under the National Space Strategy to bring together, and Joanna's sitting here, um, who's involved in that, as are many others across government. So I think understanding the evidence, knowing what the gaps are, and then what are those interventions that government needs to make, it probably, from my point of view, that broader STEM agenda piece, rather than um, narrowing it down to very space-specific skills. But I think you can expect to see something coming out of the skills advisory panel over the, the coming uh, months as they refine their work. Fabulous, thank you. Question at the back there, Jeff. Yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, if you are asking a question from, from the floor, please wait for a microphone to come up so that the people online can hear the question. Thank you very much. Um, so Jeff McBride, UK Space Command. Um, the thing I've been starting to think about, and particularly a, an event I went to earlier in the week, the particle physics event over at the visitor center, I met some really good, uh, a really good company from um, the, the uh, cluster, space cluster, doing rad hard parts. And I know a number of organizations across the UK uh, testing and, and uh, procuring rad hard parts. Having had experience with my good colleagues here at Rail Space in, in the, the manufacture and building of uh, uh, platforms going into space, 
Has there been any thinking in, in terms of parts, procurement, material, on both local and international scale, you know, right down to the components, but also the materials themselves and the scarcity of certain materials in, in, in industry? Thank you. Well, I think part of the work that the sector policy team, which is a team that sits, sits across uh, Bayes and the MOD, needs to do is to identify if there are critical gaps in the supply chain and if there are what might need to be done in order to fill those gaps. But I also think there's going to be a role here for the space partnership, which is um, being set up. There's actually, keep your eyes out, there's, a, there's an advert for the director of the space partnership, if anyone wants a new job, <laughs> uh, out at the moment. And that's going to be a, a really important body which will help government and help the sector in trying to refine thinking around some of these quite specific tasks. So whether that's how particular technologies might develop, whether that is around particular aspects of the supply chain where we face challenges, skills is another area where they can provide support. I think it's going to provide a, a sort of a, a, an element of thinking that perhaps we haven't been able to draw on before. So I'm really looking forward to that starting, um, I think probably in, in sort of late spring. Look for the job advert. <laughs> We've got a question online. Question online from Richard Plott. What is the policy on the EU Horizon programmes largest potential source of innovation funding on our doorstep? <laughs> well, the government policy is as the government policy was, which is we're still trying to associate with Horizon as with Copernicus. Um, but those discussions are still in quite a difficult place. And, and that's why the government's decided to move ahead with some of the transitional funding for Copernicus and then, you know, similar support packages um, for Horizon. Um, you know, we will just have to see how that plays out. It is very much tied up in the wider conversations with the EU about uh, Northern Ireland Protocol and so on. Uh, but I know ministers are really keen to bring this to a head as quickly as possible because it has dragged on for a long time. It has meant that the academic community, as well as the sector, has really suffered from that uncertainty and from you know, not having the opportunities that, they, that being associated with those programmes will offer. Uh, so I do think over the next couple of months, we'll see um, some more resolution uh, coming there. OK, final question from, from Nick at the front here. Yeah, it was a nice talk and great to hear that it's on the agenda at Cabinet. That's, uh, that's good news. Um, in five years' time, do you think uh, the UK would have the ability to look well propose and launch a significant mission at the same level that perhaps some of our European partners could do like Kness for instance do you see that as an ambition would that count as a success I think it's a really good challenge uh, and I think part of I mean on the face of it I'd like to say yes <laughs> uh, but I think we've got a way to go to get there and I think part of that is understanding what it is we want to achieve which is why that capability goals piece is really important because you can't get government funding, you can't justify government funding um, for just for the sake of um, you know, what, what could be defined as sort of vanity project. You have to have a clear benefits case. And I think if there's a clear case that um, a sort of end to end, the development of an end to end mission, clear government requirement for something, benefits into the sector, which stimulates growth and jobs. And of course, we have our UK launch capability. Uh, almost uh, ready as well. I think that does represent um, a really attractive proposition. Um, maybe you should stress that to ministers. <laughs> yeah. Ecosystem, exactly right. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, mean, I know there are more questions, um, but Rebecca is going to be around um, part of the day. So please take the chance to talk to her over coffee and lunch. Thank you again, Thank Rebecca. You.